Good evening all. Uh, I'm Paul, this is Brett. Um, I'll just get myself organised. Right, I'm flying this one, so forgive me if I suddenly fly backwards. Um, this is just a, just a little opener. The people who have seen this, you have to ignore this and don't answer. And the people that haven't can turn around and come up with an answer. Any idea what that is? Oh, somebody's seen it before. <laughs> this goes around university and the likes. It's bottles. Yeah. Yep, plastic bottles. Uh, it's pretty scary, really. We just put this in here just to open things up, really. Two million plastic bottles, a number used in, US, um, in the US every five minutes. Just to put it in perspective, that's an awful lot of bottles. Fill this room up quite easily, and, and some. So you can see our sort of our, our consumption. We've really just put that in there just to give you an idea of life cycle, because this is partly what the competition was about. Um, and this is really just the life cycle of, of a bottle, of a plastic bottle. Just to put things in, into perspective. Now, we refine petroleum to make that plastic bottle in the first place. Okay. We then turn around and we have to manufacture the bottle. Now, all this takes energy. It has to come from somewhere. We then have to pump the water from the ground because we're talking about sort of bottled water. And normally when I'm at university, if I have to give this lecture, there's students and they've all got their bottled water and all of a sudden it disappears off the, uh, <laughs> off the lecterns and they put it under the table because they know what I'm going to ask next. We have to fill the bottles. Now, all of these steps are taking energy. Okay? We have to package them. We've got to transport them. And that can be local or it can be all around the world as well. I think Perrier is a very good, uh, good version or good um, uh, indication of that. Uh, you then have to get somewhere to purchase it. It's not delivered to you. And if it was, well, that would still take energy anyway. You consume it. That's the fun bit. And then you discard it. Some of you do. Some of you recycle them. So if it's like me, I mean, I've got an aluminium one that's almost 20 years old now, and I still use the same, the same bottle when I can find it. Um, otherwise, I use a plastic one that's been around for a while. And it goes all around again. Now, my question is, just to you, uh, this bottle, okay, that's a standard 650 mil bottle. How much oil do you reckon, how much energy, how much crude oil is actually in that bottle, makes up that bottle content? What do you reckon? Do you think it's about uh, that much, that much, that much? What do you think? That much? For its life cycle. Yep, to cover its whole life cycle. Gasolines. Sorry? Gasolines. Well, as a percentage. Well, as a percentage. As a percentage of that bottle, like as a percentage of that bottle, how much oil would it take to, to, for that yep. life cycle of that individual bottle? Quarter? Quarter? 25%? Well, that's a pretty good guess. Oh, hang on. It's actually that much. It's a little bit less. Yeah, so that, that's actually a percentage of, water, of, of crude oil. Yeah, it's one third, basically. Um, that we actually turn around and, and sort of you know, have to take, take out the ground to create that life cycle and then for us to recycle it all over again. So, so consumption, obviously, is, is energy. And as soon as we use energy, we generate um, carbon because you know, it's what hydrocarbons, what's given off through the, the use of burning energy, which um, causes some, some issues. And this is what the, the competition, the zero carbon competition was all about in the first place, was to create a home which we could actually turn around and uh, almost zero out the carbon originally uh, or generated to construct and to build and then to actually operate that home over a life cycle of some 50 years. So I'll let you talk about a bit. Uh, typical approach to housing in South Australia. Um, I guess one of the big issues that is at the master planning scale. So if the master planning is not done with any care, then what you get is rows of houses with no real sense of orientation. Um, you know, we're all familiar with that. It doesn't matter where north is, all the houses face the street, basically. So that's one of the first big issues with a typical approach to housing. And then, of course, you get under construction, you get um, a lot of building waste, which is you know, a big contributor to carbon footprinting. And then in the design itself, well, we're getting a lot of traditional forms that are not necessarily suitable to this climate. So, you know, houses with, with windows that might be facing west and small leaves and virtually no shading. So we're all fairly familiar with that. So the competition, there was a state government competition to design and build um, a vision of the future. So basically they said, there's a challenge here, uh, who, can, who can meet the brief? So the brief was a three bedroom home that takes into account key sustainability principles and energy of construction, 
future energy use, so the operational energy, also the livability of the home and adaptability and, and affordability. So we really had to demonstrate under all of these categories um, how we were going to approach that and then with a target budget of 300000 So it's not like a, a space age home that's going to be um, proving that we can do zero carbon if we've got a million dollar budget. It was very much trying to be in the realm of you know, trying to compete with what else is on the market out there. Um, and <coughs> the carbon footprint then was a, was a combination of the energy of construction and the energy of 50 years of operation. So the site is um, Lucky Park, which is a state government initiative uh, green village. It's in Campbelltown along the banks of the Torrens River. So that site was, was master planned fairly carefully such that all the houses had good access to uh, natural light and sun and you know, ventilation. The blocks, and they don't all have perfect orientation because it's very hard to achieve that on a master plan, but it's certainly better than the average. You've got a smirk on your face, so you want to say something about <laughs> I, that, don't you? I, I, just, I just noticed that we haven't... Um, this should be orientated, by the way, slightly that way. North is actually over here, and there's no yeah. north symbol on it, which is very poor for architects, isn't it? Um, north is, is actually here, which has actually caused, we'll talk about that later, it's caused us a little bit of grief, actually. Um, yeah. Yeah. Makes life a bit harder. But in terms of this development, um, there was an urban design guideline that was done, and uh, that was actually done by Energy Architecture when I was working at Energy Architecture, so I've got a, a nice kind of history on this development. But the urban design guidelines, for example, what they set out was a building envelope on each property. And that's a fairly significant sort of step in a master planning process because it meant that this house, for example, was protected from the shadow of this house. You weren't allowed to build two storeys anywhere near that southern boundary. So we had a very carefully defined envelope that we could work within and all the houses in that development had that same kind of envelope. And then also they specified a minimum of 7.5 stars energy performance and um, this development was set up when the state minimum was only five stars, so it really was a best practice um, sort of performance village that they were trying to demonstrate. <coughs> and all the houses in the village are being monitored um, for thermal performance, and that data is going back to UniSA, so there's a long-term study being done of the development. So what's the definition of zero carbon? Because was very clearly designed, you know, defined for the scope of this competition. So embodied energy generated in the production of materials and emissions generated in the delivery to the site, plus the estimated operational emissions based on design and average use. So over a 50 year period, um, we used software that basically estimated what the heating and cooling costs would be to run the house. And then that proposed carbon footprint um, then needed to be offset and there were two possible methods of offsetting I guess was generation of energy on site or there was the purchase of carbon offsets and in the competition we outlined both of those options um, and the purchase of carbon was going to be about two and a half thousand dollars I think for carbon mm. offsets. So, three thousand dollars I think yeah, in total. Yeah, three thousand yep. dollars so yep. that was actually the cheaper option compared with a three kilowatt solar system on the roof um, which was, well, during the competition phase, it was kind of twelve to $15,000 worth of sort of PV installation mm. is what we worked out. <laughs> so essentially what we did is we, we worked out how long the PV system would take to offset the carbon in the project. And um, so anyone want to have a guess? Three kilowatt system, so you're offsetting the embodied energy of construction and 50 years of the life cycle. Well, we hit 50 years, but, uh, and a bit less. Yeah, so it's under 50. Yeah, we actually got down to 32, I think it was 32 years, wasn't it? Um, the, that's the period of time when we, we then hit, after 32 years, we become carbon neutral. So anything that's put back into the grid from then onwards is basically nullifying the initial co uh, carbon that was created to build and then to run that house as well. Yeah, so it's carbon positive from that point. Yeah. And that considers um, also maintenance of the house over a 50 year period. Yeah, and all the materials as well. I must stress that actually. Um, you know, if you look at things like double glazing that this house has, then that's obviously a larger carbon footprint than single glazing. Glass is actually quite high, uh, but that actually nullifies that as well. So, gives you an idea. Hmm. Can you go with that one. Can I? Oh, damn. Okay. Um, 
we had to deliver this project. After after winning it, that was fine. We then had to turn around and actually create the uh, the house, build the house, construct it. Had a couple of issues. Uh, we didn't. We had a team, but it was full of professionals, so we had to turn around and streamline the team somehow. So uh, too many professionals becomes a little bit difficult to deal with. So we we basically basically um, took it down to an ESD consultant, Paul Davy, formerly of Cundles, now of D Squared, and also ourselves from from TS4. So we had the architects and we had the ESD consultant. We then pulled in other people as and when needed, but we formed a company, TS4 Living, to actually, or then TS4 Stable Living, now TS, training as TS4 Living, um, to actually construct the house and to actually um, to build the house, okay? and eventually to, to sell it. Um, which we had to do initially, we had to find a purchase initially because you know, we're poor architects, we didn't have sort of you know, $300,000 to build the place. So we found a client that was willing to uh, hop on for the journey as well, uh, who's actually a counsellor in Campbelltown and embraces the whole, she wanted to live in Lockhill Park and she, she actually looked at the houses that were there first of all, wanted to, to buy, but every house she looked at was very dark. Uh, and We'll talk a little bit more about that in a minute. Um, she looked at our design and thought, wow, it's got so much light in it, I love it, I'll buy it. So she did, which basically kicked the project off. It took about 12 months to actually get to site, uh, mainly because of issues with her finance, issues with government, a whole load of, we had governmental change as well, parliamentary uh, change here. So there were quite a few different, um, different sort of obstacles that we had to negotiate around. But eventually, uh, we started on site in, and I'm not quite sure, it was April something. I can yeah. tell you the date we pulled concrete, but it was second week in April, I think, we actually started on site this year. So that was us actually winning, uh, which was quite a, it was a, a surprise, I suppose, in some ways. Um, it was good to win the people's choice, but actually to you know, win the overall as well was, was quite a, a surprise. Um, I think you'll find my, I've got an expression on my face of somewhat of, of hesitation, I think, and of almost doom, <laughs> which is, was right, actually, the way it turned out, but still. Uh, and then those are the three directors. Uh, that's Mr. Davey in the centre there, uh, who isn't here tonight, I don't think. Um, we needed to fund, so we sold the house, which was one thing. Um, we also then needed to turn around and actually, because we want the R&D we wanted to do and the, the sort of techniques we wanted to bring to this house building project, which were outside of the scope of the normal uh, sort of standard build that we'd get in, in South Australia, in Australia per se, um, we had to bring in some partners. So we actually looked around for some pretty good sort of uh, partners out there that wanted to join us as well. People like CSR, Trend Windows, Resource Co. Uh, these are some of the, the very sort of uh, hills holdings, which, which during the process shrunk from a major partner to a minor partner, but that's because of their reorganisation. Um, CSR were very good, they actually supported us very well and so did Trend as well. So we had a lot of other partners as well that helped with uh, technical information, also helped with whether it was supplying um, items with discounted rates or a very reduced rate, or in some cases free, um, to help develop the house to lead the industry. We did come across quite a few blockers. Uh, there were a lot of manufacturers out there that want to see innovation, but the trades don't, um, and the building industry doesn't. I don't know if anybody's from trade or building industry. If they do, you can kick me afterwards. <laughs> but um, we found that the biggest problem was that um, existing, um, say, builders that are already out there at the moment, they build the way they've all, they have built for a long period of time. They maximise profit. Yes, this was this is about maximising, or this is about creating profit, I guess. Otherwise, it's not worth doing it but it's also about innovation. So we had suppliers that wanted to innovate, but we had trades that didn't. And that's one of the issues that we had um, right from the very start. It became very obvious that did actually with, within literally weeks of, mm. of discussions. So we had to find a builder as well. And our original builder that we had on, unfortunately, um, was part of the team, became ill partway through the process. So we pulled in another builder and we were very fortunate they had a very similar sort of mindset. Um, and he actually embraced the whole idea of wanting to build a house very quickly, wanted to build a house off-site, wanted to look at different uh, innovative processes. But we were still stuck with, um, let's say, the establishment, uh, wanting to trip you up en route. This little idea here was something which we just wanted to take, and I'm a former industrial designer, so this really appealed to me. I wanted to take as much material out, out of a house as possible. So the less you have to handle, the quicker it is to build, so thus the cheaper it should be. Um, and this was based on portal frames, just a ply laminate portal frame, holes pre-drilled for services, based on a, a um, cement sand, no, a cement stabilised sand foundation, mm. which is a very low cement, I, in other words, low embodied energy foundation on a pile system that we designed with a, with a structural engineer. Uh, 
the problem was getting the engineering side of it to actually work and to stack up. So unfortunately, well, I say unfortunately, in the end, and again, because this was a little bit too advanced at the moment, uh, for current trade and building practices, we went back to a standard 90 mil stud, but we'll talk about a little bit more about that um, later on. What we did manage to do, well, CLT actually, I should mention that, we also looked at cross laminated timber, which is very big in, um, in Europe. But it's, it's, the trouble is there's no plant here that manufactures that and it's liable not to be maybe for the next five or ten years or perhaps more. Uh, it's used for commercial and it it's, comes at a premium. So that really from a cost point of view sort of alone went through that one quite quickly. Um, when it came to uh, just the, the sort of the standard timber frame that basically ticked all the boxes. Uh, it, it's a known entity you know how to, how to construct it, how to build it, you can get it off the shelf, and it's relatively cheap. Plus also, the public understand the system. They understand timber-framed houses. You know, if it was Europe, it's a little, or certainly England, it's a little different. It's you know, all block and masonry. But here, you know, it's what people, they like that, so it's fine. Um, so we, we tried to make something also that was acceptable. Uh, one of the, the, the approaches we took was to work to a 1200 grid system. Okay, so we gridded everything out straight away and that made design actually, it's a restriction, so it makes life a little bit harder for you, but the restriction actually also helps you to design as well because it makes you have to focus on certain areas. So we still maintain that same practice even now actually, we still work to the 1200 grid system, so all our uh, residential buildings have a grid to them, which is a little unusual for, for residential. Yeah, but we find that works very well because so many building materials come in 1200, you know, 600, 1800 increments. So by working to a grid, we, we find that in designing, um, we're not so worried about, you know, where exactly to place this wall. Do I make a room 3.1 or 3.2? We just go, no, let's stick with the grid. Makes decisions a little bit quicker. And then we know when we come to construction that we're going to be saving on waste. So that's a big part of the sort of the whole life cycle approach. Hmm. And we actually applied that to lots of different areas as well, to windows for instance. Even though at the end of the day, the frame maker decided to work to a 450 stud centre as opposed to a 600 stud centre, which completely nullified all the window <laughs> development. Um, that's a long story, which is best after a beer actually, or two. Um, we also looked at adaptability, uh, which basically, you know, we construct houses now, we're all used to living in houses, our parents lived in houses, their parents did as well. <coughs> We are pre-configured to expect certain areas, certain spaces to do certain, uh, certain functions. So we wanted to make something which was adaptable as well. So not only did it suit um, one family, it could suit another family a little bit more easily, uh, or you could actually stand in the building, could change around you. And we've sort of gone a little way toward that, not as far as perhaps we wanted to do, but there is an area here where we can actually, over this, this lounge area, which is actually single story, where all of this floor area is actually being uh, structured to take um, basically floor loads, mm. dynamic floor loads for a second story, so, or a story above. So we could actually do that. The, uh, the client, the actual owner now, can very easily build out through here, literally pull the tin off, build through here, put the tin back on. Uh, everything's been engineered to be allowed to, to do that. So that was one of the things we actually built into the house. And I think that's something we try to do budget willing. You know, it's all down to, to what people would want to spend at the end of the day. It's an expandable house. Yeah. Uh, centralised services, again a principle which we now employ uh, almost uh, religiously I think to most of our designs. Uh, I'm sure you've driven around Adelaide, you've seen uh, slabs that have gone down with, I think the last one I counted recently was 14 slab penetrations with different services. All of them need termite treatment, all of them have potential uh, issues for termite penetration to the, the structure. We have one, um, basically one, it's picking up a little bit from commercial design, a uh, core area, it's a service core. Uh, that basically allows us to service from down to uh, upstairs uh, and one area where the services come in. It's not being developed as far as it can be yet. There's some legislation issues but we want to try to develop it even further so that uh, we can keep all of the groundworks off of the site whilst the slab's going down and groundworks can come in afterwards. So we can streamline that part of the build process. Yeah, and it means that in the design process we try and get you know, bathrooms stacked on top of each other and we try and get kitchens up against bathrooms, so we try and keep all of those kind of services really concentrated. It's also got a plus benefit, um, you know, if you put a hot water system, which ours happens to be just here, then your water draw off is incredibly short for hot water as opposed to having a toilet over here and a hot water system over here and a kitchen over here, where you're pulling off litres of litres of hot water, or water just to get hot water to come through. Um, everything was locally sourced. 
as well, as much as we could do. There are, I'm sure, some items that sneaked in that came across on a boat from China. Uh, it's inevitable. Um, basically to keep the, the carbon footprint as, as small as possible. Um, one sort of little bit of fact, I suppose, it's actually, we realise this halfway through the project, that it's actually cheaper to get, so from a carbon footprint point of view, easier to, or less carbon, foot, less carbon content to import something from China than it is to ship it from WA on the back of a truck. So I'll truck it rather than ship it. Yeah, ship truck it. it is the key. The yeah. ship is very low carbon transport yeah. method. It is, yeah, and trucks are not particularly efficient from that point of view. And then off-site fabrication as well. To look at the overall build time to reduce travelling backwards and forwards to the site, again, to rather than taking eight, nine, ten months to build a house, and trades going backwards and forwards, to reduce that time and that travel time, generated carbon, etc., we uh, look for off-site fabrication as much as we could do. There you go. You can have a game well, by. Off-site fabrication, there's the, uh, the ground floor of the house on the back of a truck. So that's all the wall frames. So, you know, truss framing and wall framing is, is reasonably common. Um, in South Australia, it's still not much wall framing that's done because the truss companies say that it's very hard for them to compete uh, with the carpenters working on site. But we really wanted to push for this, so we found a truss and framing company that was happy to go down that path. But then we took it another step um, in the sense that what we did was we actually insulated the frames off site and um, had them wrapped in building fabric. So what that means was when they went up, um, they went up very quickly, they were pre-insulated. The insulation was, was put in in a controlled environment, so it was put in very neatly and tightly and then wrapped um, in, the, in the plant. And it's very tightly controlled, therefore, the external skin. Because it's all very well to you know, put up a building and specify insulation. But if you've got installers that are being paid, you know, a dollar a square metre or something to install it, they go out and they rush it in and you finish up with gaps everywhere. So by doing this, we're able to, you know, control that external skin that's so important with an energy efficient house. And then on top of that, um, we've actually put the services inside the house. So we've put a service zone that we've battened off inside the house. So we were able to put that build fabric on um, and then it was, was never penetrated, so it didn't have to be cut open to run services and the like through. So there it is, the yep. floor, and uh, we were there on the day it went up and um, I'll show the next it went one up very sec. quickly. Is this is a show and tell. I guess we better tell something. Um, this is not, the way we did this is not economical. It's not, not efficient. Uh, it actually cost us a lot of money, but it's proven a point. Um, so it's, uh, it's, yeah, it's a bit counterproductive in some ways. It did prove a point that you can, you can do this. If we had numbers, if we had um, an assembly line set up properly, we didn't have to double handle it because we actually had, I think the system, each wall panel was handled about three or four times through production before it was actually erected, which is, is far too many times. But it was a one-off. So from that point of view, to do this, in fact, the next one that's being built now at Lock Hill Park that we're doing, will not be done this way. It will actually be done uh, on site in a far more traditional manner. The, the frames will still be made off site, but they, they, will, they will then be wrapped and insulated on site. Okay, it's just something which we, we're gonna have to do because the cost implication of this is quite significant. Yeah. The wall framing plant's not set up for it basically, so the builders had to send their carpentry team out to do it in the factory and they had to still manhandle and lift and shift and so, you know, if it yeah. was all set up on a mechanized plant, it'd be a very different story. It would be, definitely. Time for a bit of video, Paul. Oh, okay. Try so that. that was the ground breaking happening and the site being dug and then the foundations went down. Thanks. So we put a camera on site so we could take time lapse and you'll uh, see the walls going up in a minute. There's the truck and up they go. They didn't even get started until after lunch. You saw them having lunch. They did, well, they did get started, but they didn't really get into it until after lunch. And uh, that's what it goes. So these are all the floor joists going on. You can see this is the additional strength I was talking about on here. So these are the, um, they're actually floor joists as opposed to standard rafters. Now there was a, uh, was it about three, four day delay between the two? We wanted to get everything done in one day, basically, and the idea was that we, we could have done that if we had an early start. The trouble is the truck couldn't leave until uh, 9 a.m. in the morning because of restrictions for transportation. 
for wide loads. Second story going up. Yep. And then we couldn't get another truck again for a couple of days. So again, we're sort of, some, sometimes it, it, we had all the best ideas and the best will in the world, but we were just um, stuck with the, the processes and the suppliers and the manufacturers that are here. The builder so did say that there. there was a fairly significant time saving because the concrete slab goes down and normally what they do is they wait for that to cure Stop. and then they go on site and they start building the frames and so there might be say you know three weeks between sort of concrete being poured and the frame starting to go up whereas in this case the frames are being made while the concrete was being laid so as soon as it was cured you know, within a couple of days, just enough time for cure, um, the here, frames yeah. went up. So, you know, all along the way, we tried to make those kind of savings, and that did mean that we were able to achieve a construction timeline of about 16 weeks. Or like Actually, less than that. It was about 12. Yeah, you, from you, groundbreaking, yeah. I think it was 16. But from the, the day the, uh, the slab was poured. Sure. Yeah, three, three months, which is, I think is, is pretty good. Including landscaping. These are just some of the constructions, uh, some of the, the shots really of basically um, the building going up which you've just seen. And I guess the video was just about to show you this, what was happening here actually. There are were, there were three things here. One, Brett, you can have a chat about that one if you want to. This is the external insulation that we've used, and I'll talk about that in a minute if you want to. So, so what you're seeing there is, um, this is the building wrap in here. Um, and what we did in this case is we we made the bottom plates of the wall frames um, thicker than 90 millimetres, so they were 140 millimetres. And then we had extra stud work on the inside, so little battens basically that went over each <coughs> stud. And what that created is an, is an airspace, so the plasterboard then went on top of that. So it's created an airspace, gives um, a little bit of extra insulation, so it's an R value of about 0.8 by the time you <coughs> have that airspace. And it meant that, like I said before, the services don't penetrate that layer. So, you know, that, that remains intact and all the services then go in. It's quite efficient space for the services to go. It also means that the services will be accessible at a future point by just, say, pulling off the plasterboard. Mm. We also, uh, this is, and this really is a technique which is used over a little bit, um, cladding the outside of a, a timber frame. It's used a lot in Europe now, uh, especially Northern Europe, where you actually have to meet our values, which are far in excess of the R values that are here at the moment. And if you can imagine you've got a 90 mil cavity, you can only put so much insulation. R2.7 is the most that we can get in our, our cavity here. New Zealand is R3, but it, that's all we've got is 2.7. So if we're trying to hit an R value of a wall composite, the entire wall structure of something around about four and a half to five, we have to find another way to do it. And the way around that is to actually apply insulation to the outside. Now, this is a styrofoam. It's used extensively in Europe. It's not an EPS or an expanded polystyrene, which is what's uh, still used here. That's been banned in Europe basically for the last 16 or 17 years, I believe, because of water absorption, of static, and of other issues that are, are not um, are basically not conducive to good health in a residential building. Still used in cold rooms, so that's fine, but for residential, it's not. So this is a higher tech version of expanded polystyrene. It's, it's extruded polystyrene, basically. Uh, it's very dense. It's got a much higher uh, ratio of R value for its thickness, uh, so it performs better. And what it does do is, cladding the entire building with this, this material, it's expensive, it's not a cheap way to do it, but it actually basically cancels out all of the cold bridges that are formed by any timber or any ill-fitting insulation in there as well. So it wraps the whole building um, in an insulation layer. It also shifts the dew point, which is something which we don't really discuss in this country at the moment. Uh, I think we're going to soon with BCA because of the issues they've had in Victoria last winter uh, where they had um, a lot of very cold uh, days with bright sunshine and water was uh, condensating on the underside of roofs, falling through into roof space onto insulation and then straight through into the, into the houses. And they, they had a lot of issues. Um, with this system, there is the dew point basically is, is on the outside face. The, the, there is no uh, air gap, there's no dew point that's, that's formed inside the cavity at all. Okay, so it's got a lot of benefits to it, um, albeit an expensive additional method of insulating a building. Yeah, and that also gives us flexibility. I mean, we looked at lots of options of kind of structural insulated panels where you get polystyrene sandwiched between various layers. But what we decided to go with was this timber frame system which gives us a lot of flexibility. It's flexible in the way that you can run your services and you can line it on the inside and it's flexible in the way that you can 
skin it up with just about anything on the outside. So, you know, we have a, a texture coat um, acrylic render system on the outside of that in most cases, but we've also got uh, corrugated iron in some cases, and so it's, it's very flexible. You could also um, put a brick veneer on the outside there and still get a very high performance wall. Mm. If anybody's wondering about uh, the gap here in termite, by the way, there's actually a very clever little termite barrier designed between that slab and, uh, and the rest of the house to allow us to do that, that detail. Ah, we've moved on to the finish now. Okay, that's actually what I was, <laughs> I'll just point that one out. This is actually, it's around this area here, which what, what it gives us is, a, is basically an internal floor to an external deck at the same level. Um, again, it's relatively expensive detail. We probably won't do it again, um, <laughs> unless somebody's willing to pay for it, but it's, proved, it's proof of concept, basically, um, and a way to actually do a detail like that and still tick all the boxes for termite protection. Um, windows, windows and doors. Yeah? Well, look, they're timber. They're timber. In this house, base. in this house, um, what we s were striving for was very livable house and in Australian climate for many people what that means is a lot of glass, a lot of doors and windows, a lot of connection between indoor and outdoor space. Now in many ways that was the, that was the reason why Jane finished up buying this house because she looked at other options that were available in Lockheed Park and a lot of the designs that were available out there the way that they achieved 7.5 stars was to use more or less standard construction methods, so brick veneer houses, for example, or, or lightweight houses that were just um, insulated in frame, but they achieved 7.5 star rating by having fairly small windows. And you know, we didn't think that was really appropriate. Um, in the competition, we you know, obviously aimed for a high star rating that we could possibly get, but we found that we would have to compromise on the glass area or say go to triple glazing, which is super high performance and expensive. Rather than do that, we said, okay, let's just go with 7.5 stars. So some of the other people in the competition, you know, got eight or nine stars, but they had to really compromise on the window size to do that. So I think that's an important point here, and that's a big difference, say, between something like the passive house approach um, in Europe, where buildings are much more sealed up um, and force ventilated rather than naturally ventilated. So I think that's really a point of difference between this house and a lot of the other houses um, in Lock Hill Park and a lot of other high performance houses perhaps. We, we had to go for that uh, very well insulated wall system to offset the, the, the weakness of the glass in a sense. Um, and then we chose timber window frames because you know, they don't give you the heat bridging issue that you get with aluminium. Obviously there are other products on the market, you know, UPVC and fiberglass and thermally broken aluminium, so you know, we're considering all of those things. But in terms of carbon footprinting, um, timber still comes out less than all of those. So there's always, there's always a balance here between carbon footprint, and cost and performance. Mm, hence the reason 7.5 star as well. Because from our research um, and information from CSIRO, we've got the 7.5 is, is the sweet spot, basically. Yes, it costs you more than a six-star building, but to get to uh, eight or nine-star, your, your price, your, basically your cost of construction starts to rise quite significantly. So if that's something you want to do and you want to invest that, that's fine. Um, but it, for, for a return on investment, then 7.5 would be about the, the sweet spot uh, for, for SA, for here anyway, for this climate, which is a, a predominantly a heating climate as opposed <coughs> to a cooling climate. Um, can't really talk much about landscape because I'm not a landscaper. It's green. <laughs> uh, the, the landscape was local. We had a landscape um, architect come in to actually do that as well. And uh, I think he's done a very good job, which we will not sure if I've put any more in there, actually. Uh, Durapal laminates. There we are. Just wait the flag for you. Um, we used... Uh, one of the biggest problems we have with this house sir, is that it's so thermally efficient, we couldn't find a heating and cooling system that was small enough. Um, we, we really struggled to find a heating system, basically. The, the smallest we could find was something about 14 kilowatts, and they kept trying to down, downscale the thing, and it just wasn't working. So we originally, the competition um, originally, or entry originally had a, a bioethanol fire, which is an eco-smart fire. It's a lovely fire. Uh, it works very well. It's um, about 1.8 or 2.2 2 kilowatts, I think, something like that, in its um, output, and that's more than enough to heat the house. We actually only need about 1.2 kilowatts of energy to heat the house anyway. Okay, 
Which is like it's just a, a little bar radiator. Yeah, it's basically. nothing at all. It's enough to heat the whole house is the way we calculated it. I mean, if all these lights weren't, weren't high efficiency lights, they were just the old types, then the generate, in fact, actually, the people in this room give off more than the, the energy we actually need. So we'd be, we'd be sort of hoping the windows by now if you were in this house in the middle of winter, to put it into perspective. Yeah? Um, the same with the cooling as well. Now, the, the cooling we actually went for a Sealy unit, which um, is an in indirect evaporative unit, which is a very efficient form now of, of cooling. It's pretty high tech. It's uh, not been around that long. But they actually, I mean, the system we had is a, resi is a uh, residential prototype, basically. Mm -hmm. So it's one which they will release to market sooner or later. It's, it's huge. I mean, you could almost live in it. Um, it's a massive unit. And it's, we downgraded it three times. It's been stepped down three times? Something like that. Yeah, to get the capacity low enough to what we want for this house. So I think Otherwise the cooling... Otherwise like a fridge inside. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Yeah. It's, it's just, again... Some of the, these are the issues we're up against. So you, you design a very efficient house, but heating and cooling is a, can be an obstacle. Because we wanted to try to get the, I mean, it's all in good designing a house like this where you can actually, f you sell the house, you fly it as such. You know, you undo the windows at night, you let the house ventilate, you close them up in the daytime. A lot of people don't want to do that. You guys sat here, here because, you know, for the reason that this is probably what you do at home. A lot of people that have gone home watching their sort of 70 inch widescreen TVs or whatever, don't want to do that. They just want to press the button. And I'm fine with that, so long as it's in this sort of house. An yeah? efficient And that's button. good. An efficient house, yeah. So this house was designed for that. It was actually designed that Joe Average, who doesn't really care about carbon, who does? He doesn't really care about energy. He just wants to you know, go out to the pub on a Friday night, do whatever they want to do, can actually press a button and the house will just work. And it'll work very efficiently. So the Sealy unit cons uh, consumes about 60 watts of energy when it's running, Sorry. I think. And about three litres of water a day. So it's, it's pretty minimal when it runs. Um, and it's indirect evaporative, so what that means is it's a bit like a car radiator in the sense that the water channel and the air channel are kept separate. So the air gets cooled, but it doesn't pick up humidity. So it's delivering dry, cool air. It's called the Climate Wizard. It's a good unit. Mm, it's very good, um, albeit large. Much. <laughs> and, and heavy as well. They will make smaller designs, I'm sure, if there's a demand for it. But the thing is, yeah. the design that they've made is going to be suitable for your average, you know, six star, 200 square meter, you know, Australian home. Yeah. With lots of West glass. Yes. <laughs> um, all our lighting here goes without saying it's, it's uh, actually it's European. Uh, came across by boat, I hasten that. Had to. Um, it's LED, it's all commercial grade. Uh, it should, I mean, the, I think the units are warranty for about 100,000 hours or something like that. And you'll notice that they are all surface mounts. So they're not the standard sort of. Um, perforated through you know, flush mount type uh, downlighter. We did that because we didn't want to damage the insulation layer. So as soon as you get a sparky come in, bless them and stick their lights in the ceiling, of course the insulation is pushed apart and then you just have a thermal bridge. Yeah, I mean I've uh, um, you know, sent off a set of drawings today to, to an energy rater and one of the questions came back was, a different project this is, one of the questions came back was how big are your downlights and what size is the peasant penetration into the insulation? So, you know, we're, we're able to go back to them and say, well, we haven't got downlights penetrating the insulation. Mm. We've actually got downlights coming down into the room. And it's just a, you know, a metal cylinder that comes down. So instead of sticking up into the ceiling, penetrating the insulation. So, you know, the detail right throughout the whole project, we went to that level of detail. Are they LEDs? Yeah, yes. they're LEDs. Yes. They're um, 14 watt. Uh, I forget how many lumens. It'll come to me in a minute. 600 lumens, I think. They're actually very efficient lights um, for their, their power generation. So there's not the, that many in remember there. Remember the name of the company where they came from? I will do in a minute. Yeah, I can't remember. Italian, that's all I can tell you. Um, again, things like you know, stairs, uh, relatively local, um, he says, from Victoria, trucked across. Um, it's a timber stair, yeah, as opposed to going to, uh, to any form of other, you know, like a metal stair for there for a spiral. We went spiral really for space saving combined. Um, it's in its, um, I guess in its overall use of space, it's very efficient. Uh, it's three bedroom, okay, and they're, they're sort of, it's, it's generous space, although when we had the open home there, we did have people walk around saying you can only live, only one person can live in this house, it's that small. Um, <laughs> at this point now, I'll, I'll preach the usual thing, I say that in Europe, the average house, or in England, sorry, the average house size now, new house is 75 square meters. So 140 is twice the size of a house in the UK. Uh, granted, I wouldn't want to live in a house in the UK because it's too small. 
But if you look at what we're building here, which was, I've told the figures have changed slightly, it was 254. 54, yeah. In the US Australian it was 250. We were build, at one stage, we were, build, we were building the biggest houses in the world a couple of years ago. I think that's moved slightly, I'm not sure. We're probably building even bigger houses now, I suspect. South Australia is Is it, for its yeah, overall house size? Yeah, we're, we're the lowest in the country. Would you like to tell the, tell the guys at Lights View that, can you, when you walk around the 440 square meter home? It's like, okay. Um, what else can we say here? We can't. We run out of time? Sure we are. <coughs> Ten minutes. Okay. That, that was a render that we produced uh, right at the beginning of the competition. That was a competition uh, render, almost actually. That's Computer just one after. Render, yeah. Computer render, yeah. So this is all the, the green walls that we put through here. So all of this fence work that's on here is going to grow up. It's going to be green. So green absorbs um, infrared. Yeah, so it should help to reduce the thermal gain as well. It also creates a little microclimate. Yeah, it's um, a little bit of extra moisture. We've got this huge wall on the side of here as well, which is a green wall to project the, um, the east-facing window. Yeah, east-facing and also privacy. So, you know, we're, we're using <coughs> that as a, as a real feature of the house. So the, the form of the house is, is quite strict and, you know, we, we nicknamed it the cube at one point. Yep. Um, but that is really going to soften it once it grows up. And it's a beautiful quality of light as well that comes through there. That's one thing which is easily missed. Um, there are sort of intangibles in architecture which you can sort of forget about if you're not very careful um, and really not notice. And this is the finished house, which looks a bit stark. It looks better in real life, he says. Um, I think that view is better. Uh, of, of course, you know, the same designs came through from the, the competition. We, we kept true to the competition, um, very much so. We just felt that something we had to do. This is a mesh here that will be green. All of these areas here will be green. This was a, is a perforated mesh that's been put in here, so those of you that come out to the house on Saturday will actually see that. Um, and in total, I think, um, I think the design, we'll see how it performs. Um, at the moment, as it's show and tell, we're a little bit concerned we haven't got enough natural ventilation upstairs. Uh, I don't think it's going to be anywhere near as bad as some of the houses in Lock Hill Park, which are 7.5 star houses, but reach 37 degrees um, centigrade upstairs. Okay. Now that leads me on if I want to be really cynical. I may as well wave the flag, might not I? Um, that basically says something about our star rating system that doesn't work. Um, we can build houses that tick all the boxes, but the construction and the actual um, design of the houses, they may, you know, those are the things that, that slip flat or fall flat on their faces. So a star rating system is great, just I guess as a, as a measure, somewhere to start, but it doesn't mean it's an effective house. So I think that we could build we are hopefully we do design and build six star rated houses actually perform better than some of the houses on Lock Hill Park at 7.5. It's just a headline figure, that's all it is really, I think. Yeah, I mean, I think attention to detail is, is so important. Um, so, you know, we're, we're architects with a passion for this and we're lucky enough to find a builder that, that shares that passion. Um, Neville Weber in Weber Building Services and you know, so he's he's really understood our our desire to see this right through at every level and the detail. Um, you know, one thing that we plan to do, and I guess we still hope to do, is perhaps test the, <laughs> test the house for, for air tightness. Um, you want to tell a story about that, don't you? you Can I go on? Go on. Okay. This is my little. This is one of my. My wonderful, I think this was done on purpose. When we started this project, if anybody had told me that when I put the camera up here, the, the time lapse camera, that somebody was going to put a tree in front of it, I'd have said, no, you're joking. <laughs> I'll put a, put, a thou, put a million dollars on it, it's never going to happen. We put it right in between the trees. There yep. was a couple of trees there and we carefully positioned yep. it so we could get the full scope of the house without any trees. Trust me, it took a while, that did. It was perfect. And then one day, as we were building this house, they decided to put some trees up. <laughs> and it just appeared. It's good, though, isn't it? <laughs> I want to put that on a loop and just keep rewinding yeah. it actually, so I find that quite amusing. And eventually I, I, I realised this is how I got there one Sunday and I can remember walking past going to get the camera going, something's wrong here, and then realising that there was a tree that had just appeared. And it's quite a nice tree actually. Um, so we had to move the camera and reside everything, which was... So you can say the house attracts nature. That's right. It, it does. I think the council wanted us to move the house actually, but you know, anyway, it's lightweight isn't it? Yeah. So. Uh, you can just let this, we'll just leave this running, I mm. think, um, and you can just sort of, it goes on for about 10 minutes, so you'll be bored by the end of it. 
Um, and it just goes through the cladding processes that are going on in a minute the camera moves. And then you can just see the actual process all the way through of all the different trades turning up. And at one stage, um, and this wasn't particularly efficient, but we had a deadline that we said we were going to hit. We actually had 25 trade, tradesmen on, on the site. Now, it's not a that big a house to lose 25 people. And I think there was something about 14 vehicles parked <coughs> everywhere. Um, it was pretty hectic. But um, overall, the quality of build I, and the quality of finish, and almost without exception, the quality of the trade people that we had there was very, very good. And they all came with the right attitude as well. Yeah, I mean, it really was a collaborative project. You know, everyone came in with the spirit of, of let's work together and do it. Uh, all the people who supplied materials, you know, did a good job of getting stuff there on time. And all the people that were working on the project, you know, really all pulled together. Mm -hmm. So it really was a sort of an exercise in collaboration, which we, we hoped to set out to achieve. And we did achieve that. And um, I was going to say that Air tightness is very important in a building to achieve a high level of performance. So all the doors and windows, for example, are air sealed, and we went to some extra care to you know make sure that external skin was well sealed, and then to also tape up the joins on the inside and make sure the skirtings were well sealed and the windows are well sealed. So we'd like to think that it's going to be a high performance house. Um, you know, the, the proof will be in a couple of years down the track when um, James lived there for for that time. And we do hope to, to um, actually get somebody in with a, with a blower door test and actually pressure test the house. So. Hmm. I don't know if any of you saw the, the PVs going on board. This is, um, this is again back to the comment about holistic uh, standpoint when you're actually you know, looking for your, vin your um, vineyard and your wines. Same for design as well. Um, the, I don't know if you saw the boom coming across. Those were all the PVs going on there. You can't see the PVs. And like virtually every other house in Lock Hill Park, uh, which has got, you know, it's, they're almost an afterthought. Oh, hang on, oh, PV, put it here. We actually tried to design ours so you couldn't see them. You'll see the water ones, uh, the um, hot water gulp in the end. I could hide those. They, they, we, yeah, they, we just couldn't get rid of those but, um, because of the angles. But the, the PV were mounted and you can't see them. And again, it's, it's that approach of trying to design a house from start to finish. Uh, it's so many aspects. It's, a competition house is a little different, but normally it would be what the client requires. It's their, their aspirations. <coughs> their requirements, their, their sort of long-term aim in, in what they want to do. Uh, and then it's also then looking at obviously the site, the orientation of the site, what's surrounding it, any rhythm of the street, anything else that's happening there, sort of solids and voids and, and the likes. Um, and then sort of, you know, building up a, something that actually sort of creates hopefully an architectural statement as well. And we're now on a journey um, to design and construct. So the company that we set up to do this one is now a design and construct company, so we've invited the builder in um, as one of the directors. So what we're now able to offer is a full design and construct service. So by doing that, we can offer architect design houses um, that are carefully designed to meet a client's brief and to meet the site requirements, um, but hopefully not at the cost of a one-off architecturally designed house. It sort of remains to be uh, proven a little bit. We're into our next couple of projects at the moment and we're costing them up and we're you know what we think is over time that that price will come down so as a one-off this was reasonably expensive but by the time mm. we get to uh, house number 10 um, we hope to be really competing bankrupt, bankrupt or um, <laughs> <laughs> either yes. bankrupt or competing against the sort of <clears throat> not the low end of, of the project home market but some of the higher end of the, of the volume builders yeah, I mean, I think one of the things we, we have to say here, you, you have to, again, look at it holistically because, you know, most people are going to have a mortgage when they buy a house like this, or any, any form of house. Um, there is a return on investment on here that's far greater than a, than a normal house. So your house will appreciate in time, possibly, if house prices go up. Um, this was the open house, by the way, we have with the government uh, representatives that were there, I think. Perhaps, yes. Um, but this actually does reward you for living there. Now, if you start to factor that into your mortgage payments as well, you can do one of two things. You can reduce the period of time of your mortgage, and that can vary up to between five and eight years, depending on the circumstance and the amount of money. Um, and it can also, um, or you can borrow more money, I guess, and do, it, and do it that way and treat yourself to your new car or your holiday at the same time. So um, that's the, the, sort of, the, op the, the, the sort of approach that we're trying to take. It's, it's, it's a dear proposition, for sure, as Brett was saying. It's not as cheap as a project home. It never will be. Um, and it will be remain to be seen whether we can compete 
in the marketplace from that point of view. Yeah, I mean, we're interested to see if we can compete against, the, you know, the, the builders that are offering a sort of a higher end quality product. Maybe what they're offering is a bit more bling than us and what we're offering is more energy efficiency. So, mm. you know, we'll see what the market decides, but we think we're well positioned to sort of take a bit of a slice of a niche market that is growing. Hmm. That's it. That's it. Yep. That's all right.